Okay, hello everybody. It's a this. packed Find crowd. Um, so this is exciting. My name is Katie Kohler. I'm a customer solutions manager with AWS on our federal civilian practice. I support NASA and Department of Energy. Um, today we're going to talk about CIDC for containers, um, a way to develop your DevOps pipeline. And uh, if we need it, emergency exit is right behind us back here. Uh, restrooms are out in the hall, as hopefully all of you know. Um, and please, please fill out the session survey after this. Uh, we only get better by your feedback, so we really, really need that. Um, with no further ado, I'll introduce uh, Justin, Troy, and Len, who are going to talk to you today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? Awesome, awesome, awesome. My name is Len Henry, and with me today are, are Justin Almquist and Troy Zorowski. And we're here to talk to you about how to do a CI CD for serverless and containerized applications. So uh, I'm a solutions architect with the public sector. I work in the education team, uh, so I work with a lot of educational technology companies. Uh, so first I'm going to talk a, a little bit about CI CD for modern applications. Uh, talk about a little bit about continuous integration, continuous deployment, infrastructure as code, which are some of the pillars that you need for a CI CD for modern applications. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what exactly a modern application is. And then uh, Justin and Troy are going to get really detailed about how they've leveraged AWS to be able to do their CI CD pipeline for a really exciting use case on deep learning. So really looking forward to having you guys here to talk about this. And we, we, we're trying to try to answer as many questions as we can toward the end. And then uh, we'll be available. Actually, this is my last session for the day, so I'll even be able to out there after the, after the talk. And Troy and jo Justin will be able to answer some questions after the talk as well. So what's a modern application? What does that even mean? These are kind of like goals, aspirational things. So we want to simplify uh, environment management. So you, everyone is going to have multiple environments. It's a best practice. So when we say a modern application, we want to have you simplify that. We want to also reduce the impact of code changes. Uh, you don't want to have a code change that actually breaks things in your, in your actual application when it's running out there in production. You want to automate your operations. You don't want your, automation, your, your operations to have to be a manual process for you to have to actually stop and do things by hand. You want to accelerate the delivery of services, because the goal for this is you want to reduce the time between idea to actually idea being implemented. You want to gain insight across your resources because everyone has very fair, nowadays, a modern application is fairly complicated. There's lots of different components that are stretched across lots of services, potentially even globally deployed. So you want to be able to look at those and monitor those resources. And then you want to protect your customers and your business. These systems have, are no functionality if they violate the security. If, folks are, if something is broken into, it's no longer a functioning application. And one of the first orders of business will be actually t shutting it down. So in terms of how you can meet some of these goals, serverless technologies are a way to simplify your environment and application because essentially all you're responsible for is at a high level your code. You don't have to worry about as much of your infrastructure. You want it, to reduce the impact of code changes, you basically want to decompose and decompose and microservices is a very popular pattern for decomposing your application code. You want to operate your oper automate your operations and a great way of doing that is modeling your infrastructure as code because it gets, a way, it gets you into a way of automating your operation. You only look at your application as the infrastructure as code. It can be teared down and brought up very quickly and with reduced risk. To accelerate the delivery of services, CICD is a pattern, and it's actually accelerating in terms of how you actually do code changes and how they actually get out into a production environment. And actually, the whole point is to be able to, at some point, have automatic deployments where idea shows up and eventually ends up in a production environment. And then to be able to gain insight into how your resources are, being, are, are, are doing out there as they're serving their customer needs, you want to have some sort of observability. So you need a capability to be observe, observe what's happening to your application when you're developing, as well as when it's actually being hosted. And to protect your customers, you need to have end-to-end -end security and compliance. Uh, security is not just one single thing. It's actually a bunch of different things you need to do. And especially for gov government agencies or also serving public customers, you need to be able to have some way of implementing your compliance regimen. So let's talk about serverless and microservice architectures for a beginning. So when we talk about serverless, so these are some of the compute services that are particularly relevant for a serverless discussion. We have Lambda, which is our serverless functions. 
And the key to that is that it's event driven, supports a bunch of different language runtimes. It actually has a way for you to do a custom language runtime now. So pretty much any language you can think of, you can make it run as Lambda. You, it has data source integrations with many of the AWS data services like RDS and DynamoDB. And it, there's no server management. Essentially all you do with Lambda is write your function code, give us some options for how much CPU and memory you want to be able to use, and then that's it. That's all you're responsible for. So however much invocations of your, of your functions there are, however many users are leveraging your web service based on those functions, the system will scale up and scale down based on your need. Serverless containers is AWS Fargate, which is our, which is our newest container service. And basically, if you have something that requires a long running execution, because you know, uh, Lambda has an invocation timeout essentially for how long you can run, you, you can have long running processes running on something like Fargate. It abstracts away the OS. You're not responsible for OS patching. You're not responsible for anything for managing the OS infrastructure. It's a fully managed orchestration, similar to Lambda. All you do for Fargate is write your task definition and include your container image. And then we'll take care of things like scaling. We'll take care of your cluster management. We'll take care of making sure that protecting your endpoints for the, for the physical hardware. And then it's, a, like I said, it's fully managed cluster scaling. So however much resources you need to serve up your, your container image, we'll take care of that. So to accelerate the delivery of services, you want to do CI CD. So uh, what that really refers to is that continuous integration, merging code from multiple developers, and doing some sort of a build process, which a build process can include things like compilation as well as things like code quality analysis, static analysis. Continuous deployment refers to the fact that something comes from ideation all the way out to implementation in a, in a hosting environment, such as, such as hosting in a containers or for serverless Lambda. Some of the typical processes that you'll have in each one of these stages, in source, you'll have check in, check out, in compilation, in build, you'll have compilation, unit testing, creating container images. For example, our code build service is able to do a check-in into ECR for being able to store a container image. Testing is, is, is where you do things like integration testing, load testing, security testing, UI testing. Uh, our, our, co our code uh, build service has a way of being able to leverage testing. You can also do that in code deploy as well, and there's integrations with stuff like Selenium, BlazeMeter, et cetera. And then in production is where you just host stuff in production, but not just host things, but also set up monitoring of things. Because we want folks to realize that this is a, this is a circle. Because once stuff is out in production, you're going to get feedback on it, which may then go back into informing decisions that are made in actual source. This is some of the impacts that you would expect to see after, a custom, after you've implemented CI CD. Your deployment frequency increases. Folks go from weekly to to monthly, to hourly, to daily, uh, um, uh, daily to hourly bills. And that's just something that you regularly see. In fact, there's some organizations that it's down to the second. They have bills every second. Uh, the change lead time, which is basically refers to the movement of stuff from when you have an idea to actually have it push out to actually implement it reduces as well. And then the other thing that gets reduced is what's known as a change failure rate. Change failure rate refers to how, how many of your changes actually result in a break in, some, in terms of functionality or maybe a security violation or something like that. And you'll see reductions of 46 to 60% to something like 15%. That change failure rate is actually something that's recognized in maybe less than half of organizations who have CICD. So it's important to realize that this is a continuum and a journey and that you have to expend a certain amount of effort to be able to get to be able to see these rewards. Some of the things to realize about the pillars of what we call the pillars of, of modern applications, we have continuous integration, which we talked about, continuous deployment, and then infrastructure as code. So the goals of continuous integration is to be able to have a build process kick off whenever a check-in occurs. So that's one of the goals. That's one of the things you should look for in order to tell you that your continuous integration process is working. You also want to be able to build and test in a continuous, in a consistent and repeatable environment. So that's another way in which you can tell that your continuous integration process is successful. And you always want to have an artifact ready for deployment. This is really important. This question, I get asked this question a lot of times, which is, do I always have to have an artifact ready for deployment? Absolutely. Because if not, then something's broken and you need to go back to fix it. And you want to have a feedback loop. And that's what, why you do always have an artifact available, because you have a feedback loop to inform whether or not something needs to change. Code Pipeline is, is our service for managing the orchestration of your DevOps process. 
It's a continuous delivery service for fast and reliable application updates. Essentially, you can do things like monitor sources, trigger a build process, and then orchestrate all the way out to deployment and production. Some of the supported services for, for sources for code pipeline, you can do picking a branch on either code commit or something like GitHub. You can use an S3 folder or an object to be able to trigger a build. You can use a Docker tag if you're using something like ECR. Code build is our managed build service, and that's exactly that, like that, how that sounds. You can use it for, for compiling source code, running unit tests, and producing software packages. Like I mentioned previously, how you can do things like use code build to be able to commit a change to ECR. You can scale continuously, and you can also uh, process multiple builds concurrently. The, I've, I've had a DevOps background, so I used to remember the pain that would actually come when multiple FERCs would actually trigger a build. And you had that whole thing about, oh, someone's triggered a build, I have to wait till that's done. Well, that's not something that you see in the world of code build. You can actually have multiple builds running. You pay by the minute and only for the compute resources you use with code build. And you can monitor it through CloudWatch to be able to tell how things are going for your DevOps process. So a couple things to highlight about code build. Each build runs in a new Docker container. You can actually customize the image you use for this Docker container. So for example, if you're gonna use deep learning libraries, you can actually do a custom AMI for the code build environment. Uh, Docker and the AWS command CLI are available in the code build image. And like I said before, you can customize the AMI to be able to do custom libraries or whatever you need to be able to have your, your build process execute. So continuous deployment is about, all about moving from ideas to actual out there. You wanna be able to automatically deploy changes. That's really the goal, the primary goal of continuous deployment. You wanna to deploy to production without impacting customers negatively. You wanna to deliver to customers faster. And you wanna increase your deployment frequency and reduce the late change lead time and change failure rate. Those are the goals that you would expect to see with continuous deployment. Sometimes folks ask us, do I have to do continuous deployment to production? Yes, that's the goal. Plenty of folks, when they start out, they do continuous deployment just to their staging or testing environments. That's wonderful, but eventually you want to get to the point of having this to production. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's completely automated, by the way. You could have a, something that's, uh, that's set up to be automated, but then have a manual trigger for it. So it doesn't mean that you, your customers should be able to expect to have a negative experience just because of something that was triggered automatically. You can put in manual gates, but to have this operationalized such that it could happen automatically will have a tremendous impact on your productivity. So code deploy, you can deploy to instances, AWS Lambda and on-prem. It handles a lot of the complexity of deploying an application. So, so, and you can avoid downtime during application deployment and do rollbacks, which is actually one of the key features of why you should consider something like code deploy. Uh, it deploys to EC2, Lambda, and on-premise servers. One of the things about the code deploy deployments is now the ability to shift traffic. So you can have multiple versions of your Lambda function and essentially shift over traffic based off of your requirements once you're rolling something out. So you can set up what's known as a validation hook for doing a Lambda deployment. So a question that we get asked frequently is how do I do CI CD for Lambda? Well, this is how you can do it with code deploy. So you can set up something like a canary or a linear, basically determine how traffic shifts over to different versions of a Lambda function as a part of a rollout. And then you can, you fast rollback in the case, you write the validation hook Lambda. So if you det detect when calling, for example, a simple one would just be invoking the functions, checking the results. If you detect that there's a problem, you can do fast rollback in seconds based off of that. And then you can monitor your deployment status and use in, via console, API, SNS. You can have stuff sent to SNS and using CloudWatch events. So another thing that happened uh, recently, back I think it was back in reInvent, was that we launched code deploy blue green for Fargate and, e, and ECS. So what that a frequent request that customers had, and we did have a way of doing this before, but it required you to do some stuff in terms of how your pipeline jobs were set up but you can now automate doing uh, blue-green deployments for Fargate and ECS. Some of the things we, we wanna talk about, when, especially when working in container workflows, and this is some of the recommendations that we have. Uh, Docker tags are resolve, or resolve when containers start, so therefore you probably don't wanna use something like a referential tag like latest or prod, because depending on what's going on with your, with your container registry, that may actually refer to something different than you think it is. So you wanna use unique immutable tags for deployments especially when scale out occurs, because like I said, when the images actually starts running, that's when it's gonna resolve that. You wanna, another thing you wanna think about is infrastructure as code. 
And what infrastructure as code refers to is that because you're now in a serverless containerized environment, it's no longer a situation where you want to be manually configuring servers anymore. So the recommendation is that there are lots of tools that you're going to need to be able to deploy your serverless solution. You want the deployment of that to be represented as code. The, the, the goals that you want out of this is that you want to make your infrastructure changes repeatable and predictable. You're deploying the same lambdas. You're deploying the same S3 buckets. You're setting up the same IAM policy permissions. You want to rele have this release infrastructure changes using the same tools as code changes. So if you want to trigger off something using a, a, a orchestration using code pipeline, it'd be nice if your infrastructure was deployed as a part of that pipeline as well. And then you also, it makes it easy to replicate your production environment in a testing or staging environment. And then another thing that I didn't mention here is that you also, it makes it easier to set up templates. Because you, if you have, for example, if you're using CDK, which we had a talk on this earlier today, the Cloud Development Kit, you could represent your infrastructure, your VPC, your Fargate service, your Lambda API functions as a template. And then that's what you communicate out to developers when they start doing their work. So their infrastructures are as a part of their setup for the rest of their application code. So some of the things that which, in which you can do when you have infrastructure as code is you can, if you have your infrastructure as code, you can unit test it now. So if you're using something like a, like a cloud development kit, it's, it's, a, it's a type scripted language. You can actually run static analysis on it to be able to validate that the things that are being done in your infrastructure as code match your standards and also will work. You can also mock your dependencies because now you can check, check it, mock it. If you need to be able to communicate with a particular Lambda endpoint, for example, you can actually mock that to be able to run, to write out the rest of your code. And then you can also do vulnerability image scans on it now, because now you're testing, for, say for example, your infrastructure's code represents all the way up to a baseline image. You can actually do testing on that now and be able to do a dynamic analysis on it, not just static analysis. And then once you push this out to some sort of uh, environment that it's hosted against, you can actually run integration tests against real dependencies and real environments. Penetration testing, monitoring to test impacts of deployments on the specific environments. There's a lot of things that are possible now that you can spin up and tear down your infrastructure. So I won't mention too much about that because I think you guys folks are really clear on that. Another service that may be helpful for you other than CDK is serverless application model. It's an open source framework for building serverless applications on AWS. And essentially what it does is it gives you a shorthand syntax. It's kind of an extension to CloudFormation that allows you to take what's written in SAM and expand it into CloudFormation for doing deployments. So it supports all the AWS CloudFormation resource types. It has things like functions, APIs, DynamoDB tables. And, it, and if you notice, a lot of our tutorials and demos for Lambda are actually written in SAM. So they give you an idea for how you can do the development of that for yourself. And that becomes, and then like I mentioned CDK already, which is a similar, similar thing, but CDK gives you in a type scripted language. So this is an example of a CDK template. And you see here, this is what we're talking about infrastructure as code. It's setting up a VPC and then actually setting up a cluster and then a Fargate service running on the VPC. So you can imagine what power you give to your developers if you as a security administrator or operational administrator provides this as a template, and then all your developer has to worry about is the image that they're using to deploy in this Fargate service. That gives a tremendous amount of power and it gives you a lot of repeatability. And the thing about this is, this is 22 lines of TypeScript code, and it generates 400 lines of cloud formation. So that's another thing to keep in mind is that this makes it very simple for you to communicate with among different developers about what's actually happening. And then the other thing about this too is that you can leverage these as templates and bring, bring out to multiple developers. And so essentially you can think of your infrastructure folks as a part of your development team now, because now they're just writing out templates for being able to deploy stuff using CDK. And then other developers can leverage the similar templates to be able to run their code. So it, it makes it easier for you to standardize, makes it easier for you to communicate, and it makes your developers more productive because they don't have to, there's no like turnaround or cycle time between signing up infrastructure because it's actually a part of their code. So I'll turn it over to Justin and Troy to talk about their platform. All right, great. Thanks a lot, Len. Okay, so um, yeah, we're gonna talk about a real world use case that we hopefully applied quite a few of these, these uh, policies and procedures. So I'm Justin Omquist. Uh, I am from PNNL. I'm Troy. Um, I'm a software engineer at PNNL and cloud architect in the same division as Justin. Nice. So for the uh, one or two people in the room that don't know where uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory is, uh, we're in Eastern Washington State. 
Um, and we are a national lab, so we, uh, our, our focus is, we do, we're very diversified, um, but our focus is on uh, earth sciences, chemistry, and then data analytics, which is what we're, we're here for. Just a quick overview, some of the things about PNNL at a glance, but let's get to our problem here. So we'll talk about our, our pipeline and, and where it came from, why we developed it. We'll talk about how we, uh, we deployed models using Docker, had a lot of success with that. Um, infrastructure as code, we'll go into even greater detail into how we did it. And then we'll go over a multi-account CI/CD process. So let's talk about our problem. Um, so, this, so our fancy title, title is the Streaming Deep Learning Image Analysis Pipeline. And, it's, and it, where it came from, our, our goal is, we work on an open source data analytics project, very generic term for saying, we like to do cool things with open data sets. And social media is a big one for that. Um, and so we have a lot of social media data. Um, in that data, there's lots of images. And so we wanna help our users get to the images that they find, they find relevant. And so the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna use deep learning. So we're gonna take advantage of deep learning models that can do image classification. So a common service that you might have heard of obviously is AWS recognition. That's a great general purpose solution. We wanted a little bit, we wanted to go after more focused custom models to, to solve our problems. And so we wanted to create these pipelines that would allow us to chain these models together, uh, run the models in parallel, and then have conditional logic so that we could, we could avoid unnecessary processing. Um, so a good example of that is a, you know, right, right away, let's have a not safe for work model and let's get rid of the junk that we don't want to look at. Um, another example there is at the bottom is the geoinference, so geolocation. And what that is, is given, you know, given an image, this model will predict, will take a stab at predicting where in the world this image is. Has, is. Um, and so it turns out that doesn't work so great for indoor images. So we throw an indoor outdoor image, uh, model in front of that and get rid of those images. Um, and then as far as performance requirements, we're, we're wanting to be on the scale of 100 images a second, which is about 8 million images a day. And then we wanted to be near real time where image comes in, labels come out in less than 60 seconds. So how did we do this? Um, we ended up with a reactive message driven architecture. And, and really what that means is what a reactive architecture is, is, is like I said, it's very message driven, very event driven, um, but it, it ends up being very robust very reliable, handle, handles failures. These models, these models are not super reliable, so they, they can fail at times. And then it handles scale really well. It scales up, like I said, to that 100 a second, but then it'll scale down to zero you know, if we, we don't have anything turned on. So, um, and the way that really accomplishes that is with this message-driven architecture. So if you notice in the picture there, which is, our, which is that same logical picture you saw before, just reimagined in this reactive architecture, all those pink boxes in between, those are message queues. So what, what, there's no direct peer-to-peer -peer communication, essentially. So all components talk through a message queue. Thus, you can imagine if a component does go down, then those message queues fill up, um, and it's not a big deal, and we can drain them later. And so what, we rely on uh, the simple queue service, SQS, for that. And we found it to be super reliable, super scalable. It pretty much is rock solid. So um, never had any problems with that. It was a really good choice for us. So then the, heart, the other heart of the decision of this, of this pipeline is, is the use of Lambda. So, as Len mentioned, Lambda is really, really powerful, and we want to take advantage of that, especially for scalability. So we, what we did is we put all that orchestration logic into the pipeline Lambda, such that it, based on the message contents as they come in, it can decide what to do next. So the way it works is images come into an S3 bucket, notification gets, and a queue, I'm sorry, a message gets put on the queue, um, and then the pipeline Lambda grabs it and says, okay, where are we in the process? Well, it's the first time I've seen this image, let's go ahead and send it to not safe for work. We'll, it'll then go down through the model, which we'll go into quite a bit more detail, and labels will come back. And so then, same thing, based on the content of the message, the Lambda says, oh, it was safe for work, let's continue processing. It was not safe for work, let's throw it away. Um, the other key idea here that we, we leverage as far as AWS services is DynamoDB. So that's where we save all of our state, that's where the labels all go, and it really pairs well with Lambda. It scales up, scales down, you only pay for what you use. Okay, so let's dive into some details a little bit more. So the way we deploy our deep learning models is with Docker. Um, what you see here in this picture is kind of the way the, the layers work together. And I'll go to some kind of subtle differences between normal Docker and then Docker that relies on GPUs. So one of the, our primary goal for, for uh, deploying these models is that we want it to be reproducible. Um, we want to be able to deploy it today, tomorrow, and far into the future. And that can be pretty tricky sometimes with all these dependencies. So what it turns out is we, we wanted to rely on Docker so we could capture all our dependencies. And then luckily there's an NVIDIA Docker container that we could, that we could rely on as well. And that gets you about 99% of the way of where you wanna be. There are some subtleties there though because 
The way NVIDIA Docker works is there's a little bit of leakage into the, the host itself. And so you end up having to uh, use the, the AWS Deep Learning AMI, and you have to really make sure you capture those dependencies because the CUDA driver that actually talks to the GPU um, is, highly dependent, or is highly dependent on the host, and the Docker container and the CUDA driver have to be compliant with each other. So that's the, kind of the ultimate takeaway from this slide, really, is just um, really capture your dependencies, so your Python package, your system packages, which exact which AMI you're using, and then that CUDA driver version. Uh, one of the other takeaways that was kind of a lesson learned that I thought would be interesting to share was just the deployment model we ended up with. So um, when it comes to the, these models themselves, we actually played with quite a few different deployment models. Um, Lambda, as we mentioned, we're a big fan of Lambda, so we wanted to find a way if we could make that work. And we found a lot of success. So as far as the Lambda success, what we found is in batch mode. So think you have a bucket with all of your images already in there. And what you can do then is you can throw the massively parallel solution of Lambda at it. And even though it's not using GPU, it can, because it's so parallelized, it can crunch and it can crank out pretty quick. Um, we found for more, more streaming environment, GPUs are more cost effective over time. They're faster and they're just more cost effective. And so Lambdas were a great solution for batch. We kind of leave it at that. As far as our streaming environment though, we wanted to keep looking. So we then went to SageMaker, which is a great um, platform for developing these models. Ultimately though, it was limited for us in our reactive architecture because of its dependency on REST. So like I said, we wanted to use messaging everywhere. So we have, we have our models, the wrapper code, pulled directly from SQS. So that we found REST to be pretty brittle as far as a, a, a communication platform or a protocol. Um, so again, SageMaker didn't quite work out for us. Fargate would be ideal. I'm looking at Len because I want a solution here. Um, <laughs> so but yeah, so Fargate would be ideal. We have, we have containerized images. Let's throw it in there and let Fargate figure it out, but doesn't support GPU yet. Um, so the next one was ECS. So a little bit, putting some responsibility on AWS, but a little bit more control. We have to, man we manage the clusters. Uh, what happened though is there's two level, we ended up with a two level auto scaling um, problem in that we had to auto scale ECS and then you still have to auto scale your EC2. Um, it ended up taking about 20 minutes in order to, to scale up as, as the, the stream um, got larger. So we ended up just kind of plain old EC2, which there's a lot of power there because you get all of the control. Um, you get simpler, faster auto scaling. It's just one thing to worry about. And we, we kind of got that auto scaling down to about five minutes. And then the, the auto scaling, just as kind of a takeaway, we ended up using the queue length to know when to go up. Let's add more instances as the, if the queue's too big. And then what we do is we look at the, the workers' utilization. And if they're not doing anything, that tells us, oh, we can, we can reduce our workers. So that was, that was the very the high level, the how, the why. And so we'll now we'll let Troy talk about more details on CICD. Thanks, Justin. So let's dive into the CICD of our deep learning pipeline. Um, start at the, 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 most ba the basis of it, really, that Len has talked about is infrastructure as code. And so with our serverless and reactive architecture, we're actually able to move some of our code out of our application into the architecture. What this ends up giving us is a bunch of microservices, which is, is the way of the future, I believe, and, but instead of just one giant monolithic service or a couple monolithic services. But with that, you end up with a ton of more components than you normally would. And so the only way to really make sure you to wire things up is to use infrastructure as code. And in particular for us, we leverage CloudFormation for this. Um, obviously, uh, the, we're, sorry. So there's over 180 AWS resources actually in our pipeline. And so you can imagine we can't do that manually. And that's where the CloudFormation came in. By using CloudFormation, we're able to reduce, um, or sorry, reduce our errors, uh, have more re reproducibility, and it takes less time to actually manage, spin up, and develop, and, and deploy. And so this is actually is the, is the key that enables the continuous deployments. So really what the cloud formation was the learning process for us, especially with this uh, new kind of pipeline. The biggest takeaway for us was that you actually need to capture everything required to deploy your application. And so obviously you're thinking, of course, your pilot's not gonna work if you don't do that. But I mean in the sense that if someone gave you a brand new AWS account, can you stand up your pipeline with your current infrastructure as code or your cloud formation scripts? And that most people actually can't say yes to that. And so we, we required everything. So VPCs, IAM roles, all the way up to our custom models to be deployed. And so the way we did that is we leveraged the conditions in CloudFormation. And by doing that, we were able to spin up our whole pipeline in a new AWS account without actually modifying our infrastructure as code. 
The other thing this allowed us to do is, a, so we had multiple developers working on this pipeline, as you can imagine, over the course of six months. And so we were able to give every developer their own CloudFormation stack or their own pipeline. That way, one person could be working on models, the other person could be working on the orchestration piece. Uh, they got identified by our, our employee IDs to, to keep for uniqueness. This ended up obviously saving time because you can have multiple people working in different areas. Another big helper for us is that we, we found the Python library CFN Linter, and uh, it's able to detect syntax errors in JSON or YAML. We ended up going with YAML with CloudFormation because it was easier to write um, custom scripts in our EC2 um, startup code. And then obviously, as Len already talked about, we leveraged the, the SAM for our serviceless resource sources, particularly the Lambdas. Another thing we were able to do is we leveraged the, uh, the nested stacks for CloudFormation. This gave us a sense of modularity in CloudFormation, which it doesn't have, like, have very much right now. But obviously, with the CDK that just was released, we would look forward to using that because that would actually give us um, the form of modularity maybe, and uh, less, less script to manage. But this did reduce our copy and paste within our, our current scripts. The last takeaway, which is also pretty important, is that and it may seem obvious, but we uh, wrote a, a bash script to basically have our one line of uh, code that would deploy our cloud formation scripts. And what that means is, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with AWS CLI, so that's the AWS cloud formation deploy the script, and then we were able, and then you're passing all your parameters into that to that call. Well, we had over 20 parameters, I think close to 30 parameters in our cloud formation script, and so writing those variables out every time would be troublesome. And so we actually made the script take a configuration file that where we'd set all our environment variables, depending on the environment we were going to, test, staging, test and staging, development, or production. And so that having that simple command, one, from the beginning, it automated the deployment, but then we were able to put that into our build process, which we'll get to now. So, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Many of you are familiar with the Git flow, the Git workflow for developers. You're making a feature branch. You'll make a pull request for code review. Um, some, if, you're, if you're at the point in the process, you'll have your um, back end um, build your, your unit test for you, give you some automated feedback. If all those unit tests pass and you, got the, um, and you were able to succeed with the other developers checking off on it, uh, it, you could merge it into a test and develop, and then that would get deployed as well. Well, for a pipeline like ours, it's a little more complicated. So you have multi-developers and you have multi-accounts, uh, continuous integration and continuous development pipelines, right? And so you have multiple developers working on different parts of the, of the, of the pipeline. And so what I already discussed, they each have their own uh, pipeline. And so how this actually works is, let's say Bob will make a feature request in, into Bitbucket and, or sorry, he'll make a pull request into Bitbucket off his feature branch. Uh, Bamboo was our, was our build service that we elected to use because it, it was on-premises for us. And Bamboo will actually uh, take his code, it will uh, run the unit test on it, and then it will either uh, create his CloudFormation stack for him or it will update the current one that he has. And so let's say Alice is also working and she pushes a new Docker image to uh, the to her feature, for feature branch and makes a pull request, our, our Bamboo will build that, uh, build the Docker image so the developers aren't building the Docker containers on their local machines and push that uh, Docker image to the ECR repo, which I'll get to in a second. But then Bamboo will, uh, will that will trigger our second build in our process, which comes up in the, in the next slide. And that will tag the image and deploy it to the updated CloudFormation stack so Alice doesn't have to worry about pushing out new updates to her uh, container. So the CI CD part of it in particular looked like this. So we had two different repos. We had a model repo and uh, the Lambda repo. And so within our model repo, we had our deep learning model, so the weights file, and then we had the inference code wrapped around it. And, the, and then on the Lambda repo, we had the orchestration and our CloudFormation code. And so how did the build process actually look? Our model build would produce the Docker images for each of the models, as you, we saw we had five of them, and then inventory all those image tags. Lambda would then build the, Lambda would then run, the Lambda build would then run, and the, they, it would run the linter on the cloud formation to make sure there's no syntax errors, run the unit test, and produce a software package for deploys, and this is where Sam was involved. Uh, the model build triggers the Lambda build, and then the Lambda build triggers the deploy. 
So where does that take us in, it's at the deploy step. So the deploy will create or update the AWS CloudFormation stack, that's what Bamboo is doing, and then it'll pull or push and retag, or sorry, it'll pull and push and retag the, the Docker images with a, with a specific build number and environment, and then it will deploy the new images uh, based off the, the newest containers. And so more deeply into that Dockerized model, the model, like I said, the models and the, and the, and the inference code is, is in that repo. The images are all stored in the Elastic Container repo. And then the image tagging was actually more complicated than we expected. So the images were tagged with, the, with their specific build number and their environment. And this was very important because of our, we, had, we were deploying multiple accounts. And so we had to actually allow our, we didn't want to build and deploy our Docker models to each account. And so we allowed our Amazon ECR permissions to these other two accounts to pull these Docker images from our development account as they were, as they were marked accordingly, staging, testing, or production. And then we also enforce the ECR policies to delete old and unused images that we don't have leftovers just lying around. And so we kept, and I think for development, we kept five of the last builds and for the same thing we're just testing and same thing for production. And then uh, obviously we deleted the untagged images. And so the big three takeaways we really want you to take, get from uh, the CICD pipeline that we built is that we need to capture all of our dependencies. And that may seem obvious, but for, for when you have models like this, your requirements file is particular to your Python um, code for, for doing inference on image classification. Your Docker files, I would recommend being consistent with all of those, using the same base image, having all the same, ideally having the same, using the same frameworks, but I, again, there's multiple data scientists that use different ones, so sometimes that's not possible. Uh, your CloudFormation templates need to have all of your resources if you were to stand up a brand new account. And then those script and config files will really make your life easier and make it fully automated from your Bamboo script, or sorry, from your Bamboo uh, builder. And so that brings us to automating everything. As Len, as Len said, building, testing, and deploying, and building everything to, to, at, in complete automation reduces mistakes, we can iterate faster, and we improve reducibility. Your development time will go down, and you'll be able to maintain your application better. And so both of those takeaways build are the building blocks for the continuous integration and continuous deployment. It, it allows you to reproduce builds and deploys, so if there's, a, if there's a, a, a weird error that you can't find, hopefully another developer can reproduce it with their same stack. And then also it allows you to easily deploy stacks and environments into developer, test, stage, and prod. And the only thing that we didn't automate was the, uh, the, uh, the complete automation of going to a production environment. That required one click of a button in the bamboo, and that pushed out uh, the, the, image, the, the new code to production. And that's, that's by choice. We feel like that's where we're at, in, at least with our applications. So folks, uh, we got like almost 13 minutes for questions, and, uh, and we'll be outside again and once we run out of time for more questions. But are there any questions about any of this? And thank you guys, Justin and Troy, for that. Thank we'll you for coming. It.